So Better we've got Bob and Sandy Duchesne, who are the uh, bird professionals, <laughs> and we'll be spotting everything that they can see. Well, that puts the pressure on. How do I get myself into these things? This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine, and we're going offshore today. I've been in a lot of boats lately, and I've been visiting lots of puffins. Puffins, the cute clown-like birds that every mainer knows and almost no mainer ever actually sees. Which is nuts, because they're right out there, somewhere. Seriously, we've got puffin souvenirs, puffin postcards, puffin toys, and gift shops, and yet how many born and bred mainers have actually ever seen one? More people from away come to see puffins than we do. We've got the only Atlantic puffin colonies in the entire United States. We've got five different puffin colonies off the coast. Many boats willing to take you out there, and I've been on all of them. So let's figure out what you're missing. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine is brought to you by Hammond Lumber, Doors Equipment, Bar Harbor Whale Watch, Napa Auto Parts, EBS, and a Supercuts location near you. First, a shout out to Bar Harbor Whale Watch. They just joined this show as a sponsor for the summer, and I've been out on their boats many, many times. In fact, I'm usually out on their fast catamaran several times a summer. In September, we're actually doing a lighthouse tour together with a unique trip up the Penobscot River to Bangor. You'll be hearing more about that shortly. I do love that boat, especially when it visits Petit Manan for puffins. Next, let's talk about puffins. Even though most Mainers haven't seen one, it's not a rare bird. There are millions of them in the North Atlantic, from here to Greenland to Iceland and across the top of the British Isles. It's the official bird of Newfoundland and Labrador. In some countries, like Iceland, it's actually served up in your dinner plate. Puffins are members of the Alcid family. They're only in the Northern Hemisphere, and they occupy the same basic niche as penguins do in the Southern Hemisphere, except that our birds can fly. Other members of the Alcid family include razorbills, murres, dovekies, and guillemots. They all nest along the ocean's edge, but in Maine, Black guillemots are the only members of the family that nest along our rocky coastline itself. All the others nest on offshore islands. You may have seen guillemots, the black birds with white wing patches that are about the size of pigeons and are usually just offshore in the rocks in Acadia National Park. There are actually three species of puffins that share the puffin name. Along the Pacific coast, horned and tufted puffins are possible. In the east, we have only the Atlantic puffin. Puffins are totally seabirds. The only time they come to land is to nest. Otherwise, they're always in the water. When a puffin baby leaves the nest and goes to sea, it will never touch land again for three to six years, when it is finally old enough to breed. Puffins can live a long time. The oldest known puffin lived 33 years. Puffins lay only one egg, and both parents take care of the chick until it is ready to leave the island. Once our puffins leave the island, they wander around the North Atlantic, sometimes as far down as Bermuda, more often up towards Greenland. Puffins can fly, but just barely. Like all members of their family, they have short stubby wings that they use for propulsion underwater, a little like penguins do. So they fly a little like bumblebees, and they're not very good at landing in the rocks. It's more like a controlled crash. Puffins first start coming ashore on Maine Islands in April, usually returning to the same island where they were raised. They start to leave by mid-August, so most puffin tours start around Memorial Day and end in mid-August. Finally, let's talk about the five islands. Eastern Egg Rock is located in the southern mid-coast area near New Harbor, not too far north of Booth Bay Harbor. The next one is Matinicus Rock, which is just beyond Matinicus Island. Matinicus meant far out island in the Wabanaki tongue, and there aren't any puffin tours going out there, though some charter boats do go. Seal Island is next. It's about 20 miles out from Rockland and Stonington Harbors, but the two puffin tours go out from Stonington. Petit Manan is located north of Skudik Peninsula, east of Winter Harbor, south of Stuben. The last is Machaya Seal Island, and that's about 10 miles out of Cutler, down east. It's the biggest colony, and it's the only one you can't go to this summer, because all the trips are already full. It's the only island you can land on, and so we'll start with that one.
Machaya Seal Island. It's about 20 acres of rock. There's a lighthouse, a keeper's cottage, and an outbuilding. And that's about it. Ownership is disputed. Both Canada and the United States claim the island. At the end of the Revolutionary War, the borders were set by the Treaty of Paris, which set the boundary around Calais and out through the bays there, but not far enough out to settle some of the remaining islands in the area. In 1814, the Treaty of Ghent that ended the War of 1812 clarified the borders, but that still didn't get far enough offshore to settle ownership of Machaya Seal Island. It was never mentioned in the treaty. New Brunswick set up a lighthouse there in 1832, and the Canadians have supervised the island ever since. But the U.S. still maintains a claim. Two puffin boat tours visit the island. One comes over from Grandinan. Nowadays, the only boat from the U.S. is run by Bold Coast Tours out of a Cutler. Actually, the whole idea of puffin trips in Maine started with Barna and Norton in Jonesport. He began taking people out there more than 50 years ago. He was still doing it when he died at 89 years old in 2004. Captain Andy Patterson has been doing it for decades, too. All of his trips have been booked for the summer because this is the only puffin island that allows passengers to land and watch the birds from blinds, that is, if the weather permits. Only around 15 people are allowed at a time, but you get close enough to the birds to nearly touch them. If tides and winds are wrong, landing is impossible because there's no boat landing in the island, just a small ramp that is accessible by a skiff that Andy tows behind it. Andy's boat is basically a converted lobster boat, if that gives you some idea of the size. Passengers get ferried back and forth to the boat, and they have to clamber over the side to get in and out. Once you're in the blinds, it's amazing. Thousands of birds are so close. The puffins know you're in there. They're used to people. They come right up and watch you watch them. They land on the roof of the blind, and you can hear them walking around over your head. The noise is awesome. The island is also covered in terns, small, noisy birds that dive for fish. They nest right out in the open all over the island. The puffins make a noise that sounds like... If you're interested in this experience, see BoldCoast.com. That's BoldCoast.com. So who are you, Kevin? I'm a master's student at the University of New Brunswick. And how long have you been out on Machaya Seal Island? I've done three summers now. This uh, I just came out for a couple weeks. This would be my fourth one, but I'm not staying all summer. Now, you're studying primarily puffins, or what else out there? Uh, my research is primarily puffins, but our we have a long term we have long term work on multiple species out there. Um, so we've done razorbills. There's a little bit of storm petrel work. The terns and the puffins are the primary ones. Now, when you say storm petrel, you're talking leeches. Storm petrel, which nests there? Yes, there's uh, several dozen out there, but generally because they come and go at night and the burrows are fairly inaccessible, we don't do a lot of work with them. The big question: Where do puffins go in the winter? Uh, that is still the big question. We have tried a few different uh, methods to try and get an idea. The big one now we're trying out is geolocators, which uh, we put them on the puffins' legs, attach them to a leg band, and when they're out on the water, it will record the time of the sunrise and the sunset. And based on that timing, you can get an idea within about 100, 150 kilometers of just where they are on, on any given day. So it's not perfect, but it certainly gives you an idea of what part of the Atlantic they're in. And now that you've done that for a little while, what part of the Atlantic are they in? We have very little information. Uh, we tried some last year and we're just starting to get them back, but we haven't started to, to analyze the data. But from what I understand, they get anywhere from our, off Labrador, Newfoundland, down to as far south as Bermuda. Okay. As a naturalist, uh, a, a wildlife biologist, I understand it's one of the most glamorous, one of the most rewarding, one of the least well-paying jobs in the world. Uh, that's probably a fairly good way to put it. You're never going to make a million dollars doing it, but uh, every day can be different, every day can be rewarding, and uh, I particularly really like the outreach part of it, so getting to interact with people who maybe don't get to see this every day and getting to share a little bit of knowledge, I find really one of the most rewarding parts of it. Okay, well that's, that sets up the next question. What is the most surprising thing that people would be amazed at if they discovered it about puffins? The most surprising the most thing about surprising puffins? Uh, I think for some people the most surprising thing is when a, a chick leaves the island uh, at the end of a, their, the season they're hatched, they'll, uh, they'll head out to water and they may not touch land again for three, four, five, six years. Yeah. Uh, they don't breed until they're generally about five years old, they may even wait a little longer and they don't have a lot of reason to come back so they'll be paddling around the North Atlantic for years. Yeah. 
Furthermore, uh, they have a fairly long life expectancy compared to most birds. Yeah, we have the oldest known puffin on uh, on Machaya Seal Island is 32 years old now. It was banded as a chick in 1980 and seen last year. We haven't seen it yet this year, but we're keeping our fingers crossed that it's come back. And I think it's up to about 37 is the record worldwide. Now, as I understand it, the longevity may be a little less up further north because they may end up at a dinner table. Uh, yeah, from what I understand, I haven't been there, but uh, Iceland, they're, uh, they're well known to eat them up there, and I think a little bit in mainland Europe as well. I don't know of it anywhere in Canada, but I know myrrh in Newfoundland is eaten. Okay, I suppose last question, what is it like to spend long periods of time at a, on a small island nine miles out to sea? Uh, every once in a while you go a little stir crazy, but uh, we've got a few people out there and if you've got a good crew and somebody you can have the same conversation with day after day, it can be a lot of fun. There's always something to see and as long as you're not island bound for too long, I think just about anybody would enjoy it. Well, is there liquor and card games? Uh, lots of card games. <laughs> and what about the first half of that question? I'm going to keep my... <laughs> I'm going to stay mum on that. So that wraps up island number one on our puffin tour, Machaya Seal Island. We'll head down the coast to the puffin colony on Petit Manan next. It'll take me about three minutes to get there, so that's where I'll meet you in a moment. If you're among the Mainers who has never seen a puffin and you don't even know how to do it, we're taking the mystery out of it today on Bob Deshane's Wild Maine. This is Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. Welcome back to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. Puffins are colorful little seabirds that everybody knows and nobody sees. Unless you get on a boat and go out and look. I do that a lot. We're taking all the mystery out of it this morning. Some trips are pretty adventurous. Some are pretty easy. We just finished a visit to Machaya Seal Island a moment ago. That's the northernmost of five puffin colonies along the main coast. We'll visit Petit Manan now. But first, a few more facts about puffins. The species name is Fertricula arctica, which means little brother of the north in Latin. The brother part comes from the idea that it looks a little like a religious friar with black and white feathers that might resemble a cleric's robe. The colorful bill you see in the photos is mostly for breeding season. During the off season, when they're out to sea, it's smaller and less bright. Puffins are only about 10 inches tall. They look so big in the photographs, right? Everybody expects them to be penguin size. Puffins don't have many predators to worry about, but they do have some. Peregrine falcons like to get out on a puffin island, but usually they go after the terns and gulls. Great blackback gulls are the biggest threats. They'll circle the island and dive bomb an unsuspecting puffin from behind. That's one of the reasons puffins decline so much in Maine. Great blackback gulls are common now, but they weren't even in Maine a hundred years ago. They moved in in response to all the food we made available for them, mostly with open air dumps through the last century. But the biggest reason puffins almost disappeared from Maine was the usual overhunting for food, eggs, and feathers. Some of the puffin islands are now federally protected by the Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. Petit Manan is one of them. It's about a 10-acre island with Maine's second largest lighthouse at 119 feet tall. Only biologists are allowed on the island. But the cove next to the lighthouse is sheltered and deep enough to get visiting puffin boats in close to the birds. The birds are used to the boats and don't regard them as a threat, so they just buzz around, often flying close to the passengers. Best of all, Petit Manan is not far offshore, so a visit to the puffin colony is usually accompanied by visits to other attractions like whales or lighthouses. Uh, this boat uh, was designed in Australia. It's a jet-powered catamaran with no propellers. It does, we'll be doing about 30 to 35 miles per hour today at our top speed. Yeah. So enjoy the ride. I know it was hot on shore, but in a moment we're going to turn on the air conditioning okay, outside. By far the most visitors to the Petit Penan Puffin Colony do it on board the Friendship 5 with Bar Harbor Whale Watch. These guys have the biggest, fastest whale watch boats in North America. They're catamarans with twin jet engines that allow the captain to turn the boat in a dime, giving all passengers good looks just by spinning the boat around. The boat is fast enough to reach the whale grounds several times a day, so the morning run stops over at Petit Manan for puffins. And when you take that trip, you get puffins and whales. They've been doing these trips for decades, and they've got it down to a science. 
Uh, now, we are going to be using a clock system today to call out everything around us as we go, and it's a simple system. We use the boat like the face of a clock, so everything we see directly ahead of us today will be at the top of the clock or 12 o'clock. Everything on our right side clockwise will be somewhere between 1 and 5 o'clock. Any wildlife behind the boat will be at 6 o'clock to us, and then everything on the left side is somewhere between 7 and 11 o'clock. Right away, we can start looking out for harbor porpoise and harbor seals. Harbor porpoise are just three to six feet long, little triangular shaped fin. They quickly leap over the water. What we welcome you to look out. Look out ahead of us here towards 10, 11 o'clock, 1, 2 o'clock. Just keep your eyes on the water. And at any point, we can see harbor porpoises leaping across the ocean. That's Zach Cliver, chief naturalist with the Bar Harbor Whale Watch. He's been on the job for more than a quarter century. On any puffin or whale trip with Bar Harbor Whale Watch, you can expect a lot of natural history and a lot of human history with every tour. This year, there are three special tours that you might want to circle on your calendar. On July 30th, there's an all-day Grand Slam tour of 17 lighthouses along the upper coast of Maine and nearby Canada. On August 27th, there's a Maine Coast Light Tour that will sweep out of Bar Harbor and visit all the lighthouses down the coast through mid-coast. Then, on September 10th, the boat will leave the dock in Bar Harbor and circle around through Penobscot Bay and up the Penobscot River all the way to Bangor, passing 10 lighthouses along the way. I'll be co-hosting that trip with Zach, so this will be a chance for me to learn some new stories from him, and hopefully he can learn some new jokes from me, because some of Zach's jokes are as old as the boat. For puffins, whales, and any other special tours, it's barharborwhales.com. Barharborwhales.com. You're listening to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine, the vast majority of Mainers have never seen a puffin. We're taking the mystery out of it this morning. There are at least two other boats that visit Petit Manan. If you can give me about three minutes to reset the deck chairs, I'll fill you in. Then we'll head down the coast a little further and hit another puffin colony. This is Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. Saturday mornings at 9, Sunday mornings at 8. On past shows, we've chased moose, bear, whales, fish, more fish, turkeys. Today, we're chasing puffins. In the entire United States, the Atlantic puffin is found only in Maine. This colorful little clown can fill a boat with spectators anxious for a chance to see one. The good news is, when you visit one of the five islands off the coast, you can see hundreds, maybe thousands. Petit Manan is one of those puffin colonies. Because it's near Acadia National Park, several companies take visitors out to the island. Bar Harbor Whale Watch does it in conjunction with the whale watching trip, so you'll have a lot of company. Another vessel out of Bar Harbor visits some lighthouses on the way over to Petit Manan. Acadian Boat Tours runs over to see the puffins on board a 67-foot boat with twin 700-horsepower engines. I made my first trip to the boat a few weeks ago. The naturalist on board was Gabby Najadlik. Hi everyone, my name is Gabby. I will be your naturalist narrator for today. Uh, can you hear me all the way in the back there? Yes, I hope so. If at any point I do need to adjust the volume or speak more clearly, louder, um, what have you, just please let me know. I'll try my best to accommodate. Now, also on the crew we have today is Jimmy. He's our other crew member. He'll be walking around. He'll be up in the galley where we sell uh, hot and cold snacks. Well, snacks. Hot and cold snacks. Hot and cold drinks. We also have the two main food groups, salt and sugar. So feel free if you want to sort of snack a little bit. Uh, they're right in the galley, right in the cabin there. We do have our Captain Jeff who will guide us safely through the waters of Frenchman's Bay and beyond. So hopefully it will be a really good trip. Now, many of the tour boats give you a lot of color in the way to see the puffins. Maybe things you didn't know about your own backyard. Probably all of us have been in the Bar Harbor Pier at one time or another and looked out at the islands on the other edge of the harbor. Off on the left-hand side here, you'll notice there's a nice island right at about, I would say, 7 o'clock. It has these ashy, white-colored rocks here on the left-hand side. That's burnt porcupine. Gets its name from those bright, sort of white rocks right when you face it, the first impression, as it were. Now, that's compressed volcanic ash. So a lot of these islands were named based on their first impression. The island directly ahead of that is called Rum Key. Now this area was particularly famous during Prohibition because a lot of wealthy folks lived here and they didn't want to go on partying without their booze, so people decided to get innovative. Now lobstermen would drop, drop empty traps off on the side of Rum Key. Canadians would come down from the north and fill those lobster traps with illegal booze. Now those lobstermen would haul those traps and bring the booze back into Bar Harbor. Uh, they're pretty, pretty clever in my opinion. 
In addition, Rome Key is in a great location because you can see most of the bay. So if the Coast Guard is coming or any type of law enforcement, they can sort of <laughs> hightail it and get out of there as quickly as possible. This island ahead of Rome Key, the sort of larger one from this perspective, is called Long Porcupine. Now it doesn't look very long from this angle, but you'll see as we come around the bend here, it does extend quite a bit. Long Porcupine was originally privately owned by a man named Atwater Kent. Uh, he had a house in Bar Harbor by the name of Sonogy. You might have seen it when you were coming into town. It's right on Route 3. So it's essentially, he was a big party guy in the area. He used to host a lot of parties. Sonogy is now a rehabilitation home. But essentially, he hosted very extravagant parties. He bought this island in the hopes that he wouldn't be bothered by the police anymore. So he used to host his parties out on Long Porcupine. Eventually, he sort of grew tired of it. Uh, the island, he actually ended up selling it to the Nature Conservancy for a dollar. Also, do be on the lookout for harbor porpoise. There were quite a few of them yesterday, so be on the lookout for those. They look very much like a small dolphin, uh, but they're quite a bit more shy. They're not going to jump up next to a boat. But the harbor porpoise, you're essentially looking for a small black triangle that crests above the water. One thing you hear about in almost every tour boat, lobster traps. You know, we take it for granted, but this is all cool stuff to tourists from away. Like I said, every lobsterman is allowed 800 traps maximum. He's going to fish the full 800, as many as he can manage. They fish from sunrise to sunset, six days a week. So every day except Sunday. Sunday they are not allowed to touch their traps. They have to give the lobsters a little bit of a break. Uh, give them a chance to reproduce, do what lobsters do. Because most of the time they're just going to eat all the time. Just constantly eating, constantly growing. Now you can get a much better view of the water tower here as we really come around the edge of the Schooning Peninsula. You'll start to see the parking lot where you can park and walk on down. Now these rocks here, you might see some darker veins of volcanic basalt mixed in. For the most part, there is some pink granite right along there. The majority of the mountains here are all of that variety of pink granite. There is some volcanic dorite in there as well. Out to sea a little bit farther in the Gulf Coast of Maine, there's actually an island called Brimstone Island, which at one time was mostly brimstone, so that's really cool. I can already see some people right up along the rocks there, right along the Scooter Peninsula, right along the shore at about 11 o'clock or so. They come pretty far down off on the left-hand side here. And if you look behind us on the left-hand side, you can see Champlain reaching out behind us up through the clouds. It almost looks like it's coming out of the clouds. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, that's like a party. Awesome. <laughs> that is our handy dandy foghorn. You may or may not hear that at some point. <laughs> We never did have to blow the foghorn, but we probably should have. On this particular trip, we left the pier in Bar Harbor with sunshine, beautiful day, no wind. And as we rounded Skudik Point, we could see clouds billowing over Millbridge. By the time we were three-quarters of the way to Patipanan, the rain started. The wind began to kick up a little, and as we got up to the puffins, the waves were beginning to build. But we got nice and close to the puffins. They were buzzing around us, and everyone had a good time. There were free blankets for anyone in Chile, and the cabin was warm and dry. So everyone had a good trip regardless. Here's one I really love. Robertson Sea Tours and Adventures out of Millbridge. Captains Jamie Robertson and Jim Parker run small boats out of Millbridge, grabbing puffins early in summer and whales later in the season. These are relatively small lobster boat types rated for six passengers. I've been out with them several times, and there's something truly wonderful about being on a smaller boat. You're closer to the birds, closer to the whales. You've got great visibility all around. Millbridge to Patipanan is not that far, and it's a piece of the coast that few Mainers have seen from the water. Three years ago, I cornered both captains together and put the hard question to them. Where does Downies begin? <laughs> Oh, down east begins. I think when you leave Bangor and you hit uh, the Hancock County line, I would say that's where down east begins. All right, Jim, Jim, Jim. When the accent changes. <laughs> okay. Well, I hear, I hear accents just as thick in Stonington as I do here. Uh, I think you're going to find what we call down east ourselves is basically Ellsworth East. Uh, if you go to the southern part of the state, they'd stop probably in Camden. I think we can all agree it's not Booth Bay Harbor. The heart of down east might be Jonesport. 
I don't want to get into accents. And I don't want to be anybody to be insulted. But even I can't understand it, somebody talking in Jonesport. <laughs> I can't either. Yeah. Now, okay, where are you from originally, Jamie? Right, born and bred here. Now, you don't have the same accent that Jim has. Uh, my, my mother and father were brought up uh, in Canada, and they moved here in the 60s. And uh, I was born in Ellsworth, so that's probably where you get the little bit of a difference. Jim's, uh, I think he's pretty thick. Oh, yeah, Jim is so thick we make fun of him. Uh, I, was born up, I, I was born in Ellsworth, but I grew up in a fishing family. My entire ancestry are all fishermen, so I probably caught some of their accent. <laughs> Sounds natural to me. That's Jim Parker, along with Jamie Robertson of Robertson Sea Tours and Adventures. Since my last visit with them, Jim's got a new boat, and Jamie's has spent a few months getting all spiffed up. I've had a lot of fun with these guys, so look them up on RobertsonSeaTours.com. RobertsonSeaTours.com. Up next, we'll head slightly south to visit more puffins, this time Seal Island, on board the Isla Ho Ferry. This is Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. We're chasing puffins today. There are up to 4 million pairs in the world, but only a few thousand where you can get a look at them easily off the coast of Maine. Puffins are about as tall as a quart of milk and as heavy as a can of soda. When you see a photo of a puffin, often it's got a lot of herring in its bill. That's the classic photo. The birds can do that because they have a special adaptation for hanging on to multiple fish. They have rough tongues that they use to pin the fish to the roof of their mouths while they grab more fish. They can carry about 10 at a time. But the world record was 62 fish at once. They can stay under for about a minute and can get down as far as 200 feet in a dive. Puffins only live in cold water, anywhere from freezing to no higher than 68 degrees. The Gulf of Maine is warming up faster than any other water body on the planet thanks to climate change. Someday, either the temperature will force out the puffins or force out their food supply. Some of that is already happening, and there have been big nesting failures in recent years when cold water fish went elsewhere. There are five puffin islands along the main coast and at least nine puffin tour boats. One of those islands is Seal Island, and one of those boats is the Isle of Ho Ferry. So, Better we've got me. Bob and Sandy Duchesne, who are the uh, bird professionals. <laughs> we'll be spotting everything that they can see. Anybody uh, see something out of the ordinary hauler, we will do our best to try and get as close as we can. Uh, hopefully, the weather holds out for us. We're going to get out there a little early. The Ferry is a nonprofit that mostly gets people back and forth to Idaho year-round. In the summer, they also offer a few special trips like island tours, lighthouse tours, and puffin tours. I often go out with them half a dozen times a summer just volunteering as a spotter because this is a fun, fun boat trip. One of the things that makes the Idaho Ferry fun is the incredible scenery. Of all the puffin boats operating in Maine, this one is the most scenic because you're going out of Stonington Harbor a working village that lands more pounds of lobsters in the pier than any other lobster port on the planet. You're going out past historic quarries, where Stonington got its name. You're going out past one of the biggest clusters of islands in Maine. You're going out past Isle of Ho. And you're going out past some pretty interesting lighthouses. Any of the captains in this ferry can tell you about the history in the lighthouses, but probably Captain Garrett Aldrich tells it best. For instance, how about the lighthouse at Con Robinson Point on Isle of Ho? This light was put in uh, mainly for fishermen, where most of your other lighthouses out along the islands are put in for sailing ships. Uh, Ilaho thoroughfare didn't used to be a thoroughfare, it used to be a harbor. Uh, these waters are very uh, proficient with uh, fish, so a lot of the uh, fishermen would sail out of Belfast, up the Penobscot River, Camden and whatnot, come out here to catch the cod and the halibut. Most of that fishing took place in the uh, fall and winter. So you can imagine when the winter storms came up, if you're under sail, you're looking for a safe harbor to go to. Ilaho offered two. One was the Ilaho thur Thoroughfare, which is Ilaho Harbor. The other was Moores Harbor and then Ducks Harbor. And they're both located kind of on a northeast uh, way so that when you had a northeaster coming in, you were well protected. You were in the lee of the shore. It wasn't until 1953 that the Army Corps of Engineers came in and decided to dig the ditch, what we refer to as the ditch. So it was turned from a harbor to a true thoroughfare at the time. Um, at low tide, we have about six feet of water we can go through to get to the town landing. On a real draining tide in the spring and in the fall, we have to come around Kimball's Head here and go in this way because we just don't have enough water and our wheels just aren't big enough to carry us over the rocks. So 
Once again, Robinson's Light uh, was actually built to guide the fishermen in here. It's a four second, four second flasher. And it was originally uh, had red, rose red panels for its glass, which actually had gold in it. There was one panel that was clear and the sailors would know that they were in the clear coming around the brandies on the southern end of the island they would know that they were in the clear to sail all the way up in the harbor once they were in that white light if they, all they could see was the red they knew they were in danger they needed to sail towards the white light today it's uh, actually a solar powered um, light it still has the red and the white flasher the lighthouse is owned by the town itself the keeper's house is owned by um, Professor Marshall Chapman, he's a geologist, he actually did his thesis on the uh, volcanic rock, is now the only inn on the island. Uh, the only thing the Coast Guard owns is the light and the uh, battery to power the light. So anytime it breaks, we have to call the Coast Guard, come fix it. The uh, lighthouse is actually, they're raising money to restore it back to its original condition and the last time it was done was about 20 years ago. Uh, they think they have located a bell for it because at one time it never had a horn, it had a fog bell. It wasn't known as a lighthouse, it was known as a fog station. Uh, they would sound that bell and the light of course was there. But uh, once they decommissioned it, uh, the Coast Guard cut back somewhere the bell disappeared. Don't know where, a lot of those bells were taken off the lighthouses and were melted down for their metal. If you're over in Rockland, they do have the Lighthouse Museum over there. The original Fresnel lens that was in the lighthouse is in that museum. Um, and there is a replica of one of the bells that were on the lighthouse. So the two you'll notice on Isla Ho on the north end and on the south end, there's two highest spots. The one on the north end, which would be about seven o'clock to you now, that is uh, Mount Champlain. It's 543 feet high. Um, unfortunately, you get a very limited view. You can look back towards Stonington, but one of the uh, peculiarities that are up there, there is a whale skull. There was a whale that had washed up on the shore years ago, and uh, two enterprising teenagers decided to take the skull to the top of the mountain, and it sits up there to this day. As you walk around the school, you'll see vertebrae from the school. You go down to the ranger station, there's a whale's rib there, and bits and pieces that are scattered all over the island. On the southern end of the island, about 9, 30, 10 o'clock, you're looking at Duck Harbor and Duck Harbor Mountain. Duck Harbor Mountain is an exposed ledge, which gives you almost a 360 degree view of Penobscot Bay. You can see all the way out to Matinicus. You look up the bay, you look over here, behind me to Vinyl Haven to see the windmills. Um, it's really, it's well worth the hike to get up there. Seal Island is not to be confused with Machaya Seal Island. This one is much bigger at 65 acres. The Navy used the island as a bombing target from World War II through the early 60s, so the public is not allowed on, and the biologists who stay on the island to study the seabirds are well trained about where they can go and where they should stay away from possible unexploded ordnance. Seal Island is one of the places where puffins were reintroduced and it's now home to big colonies of common and arctic terns, common eiders, and double-crested cormorants. It's even got about 40 pairs of great cormorants, making it the southernmost breeding colony for this species. Seal Island is also the second largest pupping colony for gray seals in the U.S., although all that takes place in winter when the puffins aren't there. One of the best things about Seal Island is that the puffins all tend to congregate in a sheltered harbor where the boat can get in close and the birds are just up there in the rocks or swirling around. If you look at the rocks right up by the grass line, you'll see some up there. Nice shots of them standing on boulders. Even on days when you think the weather's going to be bad, rain and fog is seldom a problem in this little harbor. The other members of the puffin family, razorbills and black guillemots, are here in good numbers right near the boat. There are lots of terns and gulls flying around the boat, plus the cormorants and eiders. Nice side shot views here, standing on the boulders right above the, by the grass. The Isla Ho Ferry comes out here many Sundays until mid-August when the puffins start to leave. You can get the schedule at islaho.com. islaho.com. Laughing gulls, terns also on here. Another boat comes out here, too. Old Quarry Ocean Adventures runs out here every Tuesday. Captain Bill Baker operates a campground, a kayak service, and a boat, and he can be found at oldquarry.com, oldquarry.com.
Coming up, we'll hit two more puffin colonies and then learn how to talk like a loon. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. Welcome back to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. Today's show is about how to see a puffin. These colorful, comical little birds nest in Maine waters, but they're almost never seen from shore. They stay out on their islands to nest, and when they're done raising their chick, they all swim out to sea, way out to sea. It can take a puffin five years to reach breeding age, and in that whole time, they'll never touch land once. Mostly they just swim around out there, but they'll also fly to wherever the food is. Because puffins use their wings for propulsion underwater, they're short and stiff wings. With wings like that, you've got to flap a lot to stay airborne. A puffin flies like a bee, beating its wings up to 400 times a minute, but it can hit speeds over 50 miles an hour. Whenever you've got a lot of critters crowded into one place, there are arguments. On an island with hundreds or thousands of puffins, often tempers flare, and they have a few things to work out between themselves over territory and stuff. They start by puffing up their body to look bigger, and they open their wings and beaks to look intimidating. The wider the beak is open, the more mad the puffin is. The puffin may stomp his feet. The bright colors exaggerate all of this, and usually it's enough to settle the matter, but sometimes the puffins get right into it. They'll lock beaks, attempt to wrestle each other, and try to knock the other one over. This usually draws a crowd of other puffins to watch. It can get so involved that the pair actually falls off the rock they're on. So far, from north to south, we've hit Machaya Seal Island, Patipanan, and Seal Island. The next one down is Matinicus Rock, a 22-acre island owned by the feds, and it's part of the Maine Coastal Island National Wildlife Refuge. There's a lot of history at this rock. The first light station was built in 1827. Toward the end of that century, it became fashionable to put birds on hats, and you can imagine how attractive a puffin hat would be. In 1901, lighthouse keepers in the island were paid double duty to be wardens, protecting the colony against market hunters. But by that point, only one pair of puffins remained, and the wardens had only gulls and terns left to protect. Because the island is about 23 miles from the nearest mainland port, there are no regularly scheduled puffin trips to Matinicus Rock. However, a water taxi service called Matinicus Excursions can be chartered for a trip. Eastern Egg Rock is the southernmost colony, and it's the reason we still have puffins in Maine. It's the smallest at only seven acres, and it's only six miles away from a port in New Harbor. It's a little different than the other islands because the interior has a lot of dense vegetation, well fertilized by bird poop. That makes it a good place for a federally endangered bird called a roseate tern to nest, and it's the easiest place in Maine to see one of those. It's also good for eiders and laughing gulls. Eastern Egg Rock is owned by the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, making it the only puffin colony actually owned by the state. This is where we learned how to restore a seabird colony. It started in 1973 when a man named Steve Cress tried some new techniques to bring puffins back. The last puffins were wiped out of the island in 1885. Cress got permission to transplant nearly a thousand young puffins from Newfoundland. Then he set up decoys and played loud audio of puffin and turn sounds, trying to make it look and sound like an occupied colony. Well, in 1981, five pairs of puffins returned, and now there are a couple of hundred puffins on the island. There are over a thousand pairs of terns on the island, and that's important to the puffins because the terns are fast and acrobatic, and they will often drive off predators and other troublemakers, giving puffins some cover. Three boats visit Eastern Egg Rock. The island gets a lot of visitors because it is the closest to a convenient port. Hardy Boat Cruises takes only 90 minutes to get out there and back from New Harbor, so the price is only 30 bucks, the lowest price around for a puffin trip. The Monhegan Boat Line visits the island daily for the same price, and that one goes out of Port Clyde. It takes about two and a half hours on that trip. Captain Fish also takes about the same amount of time coming over from Booth Bay Harbor. So that's it. Five islands, four of them with regular boat trips scattered up and down the coast. Each island offers something different. The biggest colony is Machaya Seal Island, where you can actually go on the island, but that sells out far in advance every year. There is Petitmanan Island with three boats visiting daily, and you can combine it with whale watching in the Bar Harbor Whale Watch boat. 
There's Seal Island, in which case you'll probably be on the boat with me. And if you're in southern Maine, eastern Egg Rock is quick and easy. Now, you have no excuse for being among the 99% of Mainers who have never seen a puffin. We'll close out the show with another bird, the common loon. We've got about 3,700 loons in southern Maine, and we know because we count them. There aren't enough people in northern Maine to count all the loons on remote ponds and rivers up there. The count is the annual loon count, and that's coming up in two weeks. Over 900 volunteers will go out on the lakes on Saturday morning, July 16th, and count up every loon. This is another one of those iconic Maine species that can get in trouble. They can die of lead poisoning from lost fishing tackle or get tangled in monofilament. They can suffer from predation by eagles. A year ago, I spent a few minutes in the show explaining how to talk loon. Time to refresh the lesson. When you break it all down, there are four distinct vocalizations they make. They may mean slightly different things under slightly different circumstances, but this will give you something to listen for and to watch for under the circumstances in which they do these things. Number one, the pear tremolo. It's the crazy laugh. And if you've ever heard crazy as a loon, this is where it comes from. Sometimes at night they're doing this call just to announce their presence, a territorial call that warns other intruding loons to stay away from their side of the lake. When it's dark, loons don't know when they're straying into each other's territories, so you hear them a lot at night making sure they don't get into an unnecessary conflict. Loons will fight each other, sometimes to the death. During the day, the tremolo is often a warning sign of danger. For instance, if an eagle flies over the lake, or a seaplane takes off, or boats get too close, look to see if the tremolo is their alarm reaction to the disturbance. If a second loon answers, it is likely the mate, announcing that it understands the danger and may be coming to help out against any threat to the nest or chick. Sometimes you'll hear this when a loon is flying overhead. That's just an announcement call to let other loons know its presence, again, to avoid conflict. Loons don't make a lot of noise when they're out on the ocean, but they will give the warning tremolo sometimes. I was nine miles offshore in a puffin watch a few weeks ago, and a loon got nervous about the boat and gave off the tremolo. Number two, the whale. This is the haunting call that loons use to tell each other their locations. Pairs try to stay together, both to protect the young and sometimes to cooperate on feeding, so they tell each other where they are. If you see a pair close together, they're probably not wailing all that much because they don't have a story to tell. But once they drift apart some distance, expect the wail. And you might expect the two birds to move slowly closer together. Number three, the yodel. Only the male does this one. This is strictly territorial. Each male loon has his own distinctive yodel, and he'll even change it up if he changes location, perhaps when he moves to another pond. Loons will fight, so staking out territorial claims helps avoid bloodshed. If you see loons rising up and flapping wings while making the yodel, 
or even starting to dance across the surface a little bit, the territorial argument is starting to get serious. And remember, if you're in a boat and you're getting close, that warning yodel may be for you. Loons start to get uncomfortable when you get within about a football field length of their nests. If it's a tremolo as you're getting close, that may be the female expressing alarm too. Take the warning and move off. Number four, the hoot. These are the soft, short noises that loons make to each other to keep the family close together. Parents may hoot to the chick or they may hoot to each other. Actually, it's not terribly different than what chickens do. Whenever they're foraging around the yard, all those little clucking sounds are just organizational, keeping the clan together for safety and cooperation. Once again, the Maine Loon Count is Saturday, July 16th. If you want to help, get in touch with Maine Audubon. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine airs every Saturday morning at 9 and Sunday morning at 8. This show and all previous shows are archived online at 929theticket.com. It's brought to you by Hammond Lumber, Doors Equipment, Bar Harbor Whale Watch, Napa Auto Parts, EBS, and a Supercuts location near you. This is Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket.